My name is Federico Rampini. I will be your professor this afternoon and tomorrow. Uh, I am, uh, I'll briefly introduce myself. I'm a, a reporter and a writer, uh, occasionally only a professor. I teach that uh, as a visiting professor at UC Berkeley and uh, Shanghai University of Finance and Economics. Um, I I live actually in uh, New York City, and I've lived uh, for 30 years uh, commuting between Europe and the rest of the world. The last uh, 12 years of my life between the United States and uh, China. In fact, San Francisco for, five, for four years, uh, Beijing five years, New York City two years. Um, I don't know if you had if you've had the opportunity to. Uh, take a look at the uh, reading materials I uh, distributed. No? But, OK, no problem. You'll have them when uh, your homework part, task, will, will start. Um, the, uh, the title of this uh, course is East and West uh, Cultures as Boundaries or Barriers. And let me uh, uh, summarize uh, the uh, the objectives of the course. Uh, we are in the middle of a crisis, which I believe is not just uh, an ordinary economic crisis. It's uh, uh, something like a historical shift. So we cannot afford to see anymore the West as the center of the world. We have to, to learn from the rest the rest of the world, which is the East uh, and possibly also the South. Uh, the emerging countries' uh, influence is growing, but we are ill-prepared uh, to understand them. The language of economics, finance, and business uh, is inadequate uh, to grasp uh, all the implications of this upheaval, because it has the, this upheaval as first and foremost, uh, a political and cultural dimension. While the West, and by the West, I obviously mean uh, uh, the United States and, uh, and Western Europe, or Europe as a whole. Uh, while the West is going through the, the great contraction, this is a definition given by Kenneth Rogoff, uh, a distinguished economist and former IMF uh, chief economist. Uh, so, which means a crisis that has no meaningful antecedent except the Great Depression of the 30s. At the same time, we are also uh, approaching the end of a five-century historical period of Western hegemony on the world. So, China, India, Brazil, have been deeply shaped by our influence in the last centuries. Uh, what exactly has been uh, the far-reaching impact uh, on their values, their aspirations, their expectations of our own influence? And now that the West is experiencing decline, I think long-term structural decline, what are the ongoing adaptations in the balance of power, in the narrative of economic models, social values, lifestyles? So this is basically the starting point of my course through uh, anecdotal examples, real life stories. We will serve together the fast changing and very unstable relationship between the West and the rest, where culture and politics, I believe, are indispensable tools also for any business strategy. I will try to provide you with an understanding of the historical background and cultural framework that shape uh, interactions and competition between developed and emerging economies. By the way, emerging is probably already an outdated definition. They, they have emerged. Uh, I will use real life examples drawn from my 30 year experience uh, as a writer in Asia, Latin, Latin America too. 
uh, and try to equip you with uh, the analytical tools that you will need in your professional life. Uh, first of all, to challenge your own uh, cultural stereotypes uh, and approach a fast-changing world shaped by a growing diversity of ethnic and historical background. So let me start for this uh, uh, introductory lesson by recounting one uh, recent experience of my life in New York City. Um, after a day immersed in the stress of Manhattan life, uh, there is nothing better to me to regenerate my spirit than going to every Fisher Hall, that's uh, Lincoln Center's uh, concert hall, for a performance by New York Philharmonic Orchestra. And while I let uh, Mozart or Beethoven lull me, I can't help but notice uh, a very interesting phenomenon. It is the growing number of Asian musicians especially in the string section of the orchestra, violas, violins, uh, cellos. The majority of mu musicians are now Chinese, Japanese, Koreans. The New York Philharmonica is, uh, you probably know, one of the best orchestras in the world. And those who are part of it are therefore at the top of their profession. The Asian musicians uh, excellent orchestral players, uh, as well as great soloists, are also increasing in the ranks of the Philharmonics in Berlin, Chicago, Vienna, London, or here, Milano, at La Scala. Um, and this invasion of Asian music musicists is not only the confirmation that the Far East uh, produces competitive talents uh, in all fields and all human activities, something that no longer surprises us. But there is another aspect that I find uh, even more important. A Chinese girl, if you think of it, a Chinese girl isn't born into the same society that created Mozart. Uh, classical Chinese music uh, is made of an entirely different type of harmonies and melodies. I myself absorbed uh, some of the Chinese traditions very, very slowly when I lived in Beijing uh, and I attended the Beijing Opera for years. It's a musicality that is very distant from ours uh, and one needs to train the ear for a while in order to appreciate Chinese music. Now, the fact that uh, Chinese or Japanese or Korean academies and conservatories graduate uh, so many enfants prodige in the execution of Beethoven and uh, Mozart or Mahler or Verdi is the confirmation of another Asian skill, the openness uh, towards Western cultures. How many Italian or German or American children in this very moment are studying Chinese music? Probably very few or even zero. In this uh, asymmetry between us and them, we fool ourselves by thinking that we are finding a confirmation of our cultural superiority. Instead, this is only a proof that, unfortunately, we are less curious. When China rules the world is the title of... Uh, it's, a, it's a hard title that feels like a punch in the stomach. It's a st the title of a, an essay by a very distinguished uh, British scholar, Martin Jacques. Uh, Maybe because of the title, uh, this book, which was uh, published a couple of years ago in the US uh, and Britain, had in fact more success in China, uh, Taiwan, Japan, Indonesia. Uh, maybe it's too difficult for us to confront ourselves with uh, Martin Jacques' conclusions. Uh, what, he, what Martin Jacques says, I quote him, uh, is that 
Europe has abandoned the effort to elaborate an idea of the future. To the Chinese, I'm still quoting, it only knows, Europe only knows how to express a long series of complaints that can be summed up in a single one. Why are you not like us? In the, in the subtitle to his book, Martin Jack evokes uh, the rise of the Middle Kingdom and the end of the Western world. The ruling class uh, of the United States uh, is itself under attack. And I quote again Martin Jack, the US is gravely unprepared in the face of China's ascent. They haven't really understood it. They have underestimated its importance and the consequences. Only after the latest financial crisis has the American elite started to become seriously aware of the decline of their own country. And it's really late. Not long ago, they still cloaked themselves in an idea of invincibility. The triumphalism of the 90s, the 90s, the decade of the last millennium, the idea that the 21st century was going to be the new American century. All this was happening just a few years ago, and it has shown a diabolical misunderstanding of history by the American elite. What prevents these ruling classes from understanding China? I quote again, again uh, Martin Zak. The fact that up until now, they considered China a nation destined for a future like ours. In other words, to become a semi-Occidental society. Little attention has been paid to the possibility that China, even though it is transforming, will remain profoundly different from us. The US, by its nature, is not equipped to accept such a radical difference. End of quote. Uh, I remember covering as a reporter uh, Barack Obama's trip to China in November of 2009. Uh, and uh, that, that trip was preceded by enormous expectations. At that time, you might remember, there was a talk of the birth of a G2, that the world would be governed by this very powerful couple, US and China. Instead of G8, instead of G20, there would be a G2. Uh, and from that moment on, after that trip, uh, practically everything went wrong in the US-China relationship. It seems like there were only disappointments from the environment to human rights. There was the, uh, the failure of the Copenhagen summit at the end of 2009 on the environmental issues. There was a, a war between Google and the Chinese government that forced Google to uh, withdraw from China. Uh, then Taiwan, Tibet, uh, you name it. So China, in the eyes of the West, uh, has become the power that says no. The reactions to that trip are emblematic in that the ruling class and the public opinion were unprepared. Obama himself was accused by his fellow Americans of being too nice, too cautious in his approach to China. Instead, he was being very realistic. He kept into account the new balance of power. Uh, also, as far as Tibet, uh, Taiwan, the environment, a close analysis of each one of, the, of these topics uh, shows that the Chinese position has been basically the same for years. Uh, the priorities of the rulers in Beijing are clear. In the first place comes economic growth, which is necessary to eradicate the poverty still widespread in large areas of that country. A country which we would probably better define as a continent. In second place, and closely related, the People's Republic of China has to ensure more favorable international relations so as to be able to pursue its first objective, including, therefore, a more stable relationship with the United States. Now, it's true that China has become, in recent years, more 
assertive, more determined, more aware of the new power structures, but there is no sudden shift in its strategy, no drastic uh, second thoughts. Their strategy has worked for 30 years, why should they abandon it? The Chinese are extraordinarily patient. They have a long-term vision, and actually extremely long vision. Uh, the real risk is probably in the American reaction. The expansion of Chinese influence on the five continents is inevitable, but it creates uh, rivalries with the US in every corner of the world. Uh, the ascent of China goes beyond the economic, uh, political and military spheres. Uh, Martin Jack uh, evokes uh, hegemony in the way Antonio Gramsci defined this term. You, you might not be familiar with Antonio Gramsci. He, is, he was a, a famous uh, Marxist uh, thinker in Italy. In fact, the founder of the Italian Communist Party back in the 20s, 1921. And he's very, very, very well known and studied uh, even among neoconservative scholars in the US, like uh, uh, the late Samuel Huffington or Huntington or uh, Francis Fukuyama. Uh, in order for China to really dominate the world, it will also have to compete with the US on the cultural terrain. Uh, according to Martin Jacques, uh, China is uh, a much richer society than the US. American hegemony's strength is popular culture, movies, uh, music. But as far as the rest goes, the US starting point is very recent. It dates back to the arrival of the Pilgrim Fathers on the Mayflower in 1620. China is sitting on a cultural treasure. Its tradition of a central state is 2,000 years old. And other aspects of its culture are even older than that. It has, therefore, one of the richest and most ancient languages in the world. Uh, to be able to project outside uh, with a hegemonic capacity, one needs cultural resources and modernity. Up until recent times, the Chinese society embodied a poor and underdeveloped country that no one would have wanted to imitate. But today this has changed. The inaugural ceremony at the Beijing Olympics, uh, which I attended in August of 2008, was a interesting example of how China can now re-elaborate its own history, presenting it through a more modern communication and entertainment techniques. For us, it remains an unshakable diversity, which makes it so hard to accept uh, the possibility even of a Chinese hegemony. Uh, we believe we have incompatible values liberal democracy and human rights. Uh, for this reason, the West uh, will be more averse to Chinese cultural penetration and will try to resist. China has less to offer us, but it has already made significant advances in the rest of the world. In emerging countries, China represents an effective alternative to what was dubbed the Washington Consensus. During the last economic crisis in particular, starting 2008, Beijing has shown increasingly more evidence of its uh, very efficient state, more efficient than ours. Hegemony is also made of these things, authorities that give results. The last of the observation that I draw from Martin Jacques' essay is on how the West should behave. I quote him, the West sees itself like the most cosmopolitan of all cultures. It is a curious reversal or even a delusion. In fact, we are the most provincial, we Europeans or Americans. All other cultures from the 18th century on have had to confront themselves with a more powerful adversary. The European colonization 
followed by the so-called Americanization, have forced all the other cultures into an upheaval. They have been compelled, even by force, to become cosmopolitan. We haven't gone through this experience, and consequently we are profoundly ignorant. The rise of China will be a learning process for us. There will be aspects that we do not like at all about that society, and others we will find interesting. In either case, the movement of power from the US toward China is an inevitable process. It doesn't depend so much on individual choices or individual mistakes that this or that uh, American administration might make. It is the movement of more profound forces that go beyond the influence of our leaders. Now, the Chinese century, which is the title of one of my books, uh, is uh, a, f a definition or a forecast that resonates very differently with Americans or Europeans. Americans have had their century very recently. The 20th century was dubbed the American century. We, as Europeans, uh, uh, we have lived through the American century, which means that we have already been through the experience of losing influence over the rest of the world. We Europeans, we began as number one, and we have conceded defeat. So we saw the center of the world shifting from our con continent to a new one. Here are some signs of the new shift which is coming very soon. Uh, already in 2005, China overcame the United States as the first importer of raw materials, commodities, and agricultural supplies from the rest of the world. On that same year, China overcame the US also as the first exporter of information technology goods, uh, personal computers or cell phones. Long time ago, China also overcame Japan as the first creditor of the United States. Now, sheer size makes China a very, very different story from any other emerging country before. If you add up the population of Europe to the population of the United States, you still have only half of China. This means that China has the capacity to be an economic superpower and an emerging country at the same time, which never happened before. Didn't happen with Japan, with the Japanese rise. Uh, they were first an emerging country and then a developed one. China can remain both things together for decades. Uh, it can have advanced technologies, competitive startup enterprises, a vast wealthy middle class, and at the same time, uh, an enormous pool of underpaid labor force, which will continue to put a downward pressure on labor costs all over the world. Because that pool of labor won't dry up as quickly as it happened in much smaller countries like Japan or South Korea. Now, thinking again of the shift from the American century to a different kind of century in the 21st, uh, just two generations ago, two generations is a very, very short period of time. Two generations ago, when my, my grandparents were born, that is at, at the beginning of the 20th century, the center of their world was indeed in London, Paris, Berlin, Vienna, and marginally Italy. So before World War I, they could not possibly imagine the whole concept of Americanization uh, that we have been using in the last decades almost as a synonym of globalization. We are very familiar to Americanization. But even though the rise of America has made Europe less important and somehow peripheric in the geography of power, still the American century belonged to us too. Uh, much of the 20th century has seen an extended hegemony, 
political, military, economic, cultural hegemony of white people, white Caucasic people, as they are called in the uh, federal census uh, in the United States. That's, that means people like me. Uh, America in its infancy had been colonized by us, European. And although the land was originally populated by Native Americans, it appeared as a vast and almost empty space. So European people filled that space with their own content in terms of ideologies, values, uh, traditions. China is a very different story. China is by no means an empty space. It is crowded, full of people. It's a land of emigration, not a land of immigrants. It is also very full of its own history, of civilization. So it will shape the world with the weight of 1.3 billion people who are the heirs to millennia of history. And for the first time in contemporary history, we are faced with the possibility that the largest economy in the world will not be a democracy. Uh, this is a completely unknown challenge for us. There is no possible comparison between this and the challenges that the West faced in the confrontation, even with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. The Soviet Union was a political superpower, a military superpower, never, never an economic superpower. Uh, its weight in the world economy was minimal. Uh, the Soviet Union was also demographically a midget. Its dominant ethnic group, the white Russians, have been declining for a long time. The sheer size of the Chinese population is a driving force towards expansionism. Think of their need of natural resources. And it's a drive which is much more powerful than the communist ideology which was the engine of Soviet expansionism. Now, we know how to deal with democracies because we know their rules of the game. Their political actors are relatively transparent. Uh, their decision-making process is characterized by existence of checks and balances, oppositions, counterpowers, a very public debate, uh, uh, free media. Those who today do not like, like the French uh, or uh, some Latin American countries, do not like living under an American leadership, may underestimate uh, or misread the consequences of the rise of an undemocratic China. And my guess is that the Chinese century will be the century when uh, China becomes a democracy or it will be a dangerous times. Or I stand corrected, it will be a very interesting time, as the Chinese would say in their own way. Now let me remind again of a few paradoxes about China. China is the second largest economy in the world already, right now. Uh, and yet, its per capita income lags behind 100 other nations. 100 other nations. It is the first poor superpower in contemporary history. Uh, its rate of economic growth has been steadily above 5% and more recently around 10% per year in the last three decades it has increased tenfold its per capita income since 1979, which is a very important year because it's the start of the transition to a market economy. Uh, but let's remember this. Uh, it's the latest data from the World Bank. Uh, Robert Zölig, the chairman of the World Bank, reminded it uh, at the G20 summit in Cannes a couple of weeks ago that the Chinese, whom we are asking to fund, to finance uh, um, the European Union uh, salvage fund, the EFSF, the special facility that should uh, uh, fund uh, the public debt of Greece or Italy, we are asking the sovereign fund of China to help us. Well, this is a country where per capita income is now $4,000 per year, whereas the average per capita income in 
the Eurozone is 38,000 per year. This including Greece. Uh, China has a relatively open economy, uh, certainly much more open than other economies were at a similar stage of development. It is the second recipient of foreign direct investment after the US. Its tariff or non-tariff barriers to imports are much lower than in the average emerging countries. And yet, this uh, open economy of China is governed under a political system that allows no opposition, no freedom of speech, no challenge to the Communist Party rule. As another symptom of the gap between its uh, economic uh, and technological development and its political evolution, China graduates every year 800,000 students in math, engineering and sciences. 800,000, it's almost a million every year, graduates. But the whole country has only 120,000 lawyers, which gives you a, a measure of the a measurement of the uh, underdevelopment of the rule of law. Uh, although many, many positive changes have occurred uh, even in the realm of uh, personal freedoms, like the freedom to choose your school, your university, your job, uh, your wife or your husband, uh, the freedom to travel abroad or just to interact with foreigners in your own country, compared with Mao Zedong China, the real communist China, uh, where these freedoms were not allowed. Still, some fundamental features of their political system are still now the legacy of Mao Zedong, the founder of communist China. The single political party that ruled the country in 1978 when per capita income was 200 US dollars is ruling a country where per capita income is now over 4,000. Will it be the same? Can it be the same when Chinese per capita income will increase over 5,000 or 10,000 US dollars? There is really no precedent that we can use in order to evaluate the impact of China and India on our economies and on our societies. The economic miracles of Japan in the 60s and the 70s, then South Korea, then other Southeast Asian dra dragons, all these countries bear not comparison with the demographic scale of China and India. And of course, we can already see some very familiar patterns showing up. Both India and China are moving up very fast along the value-added chain. In the case of India, we might say that it jumped the value-added chain, specializing in high-tech industries and service sectors, even before it had a strong and competitive manufacturing basis. In China, you can see strains in the old model of growth. The most labor-intensive productions, like the textile and apparel industry, already had their profit margin squeezed, not only by new entrants in competition like Bangladesh or Vietnam, but also because of wage increases. In Guangdong, which is the, the southern uh, province of China, where uh, Canton, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen are uh, near Hong Kong, uh, the average salary increased by 15% just last year. And still, before their salaries come nowhere near European or North American salaries, for years to come, both China and India will be able to tap into enormous and cheap labor forces. Because the rural, pop the rural population is about the same in both countries. 700 million in China, 700 million in India. And think of this in terms also of an impact on natural resources, environmental sustainability, that every time a peasant leaves the countryside and emigrates into a Chinese town to get a job in a factory or in a construction site, its individual contribution to GDP increases by 700%. That's the impact of the rural exodus. 
But it would be a mistake still to see China and India mainly as competitors for our manufacturing industries and as a challenge only for our blue collar workforce. Low salaries won't be the only ingredient in the success of these emerging countries. Already today, wages are only 20% of total production costs in textile and apparel industry. And they are only 5% of overall production costs in semiconductors, electronic industry. And still, Apple produces everything. Your iPhone, your iMac, your iPad, everything is, is assembled in one single production site in China, Foxconn in Shenzhen. Uh, in, already in 2006, China overtook Japan and every single European country for the volume of its investments in R&D. They are spending a lot in research and development. Um, and these are OECD data, which include only R&D investments funded by governments or government-controlled uh, institutions. But China and India are also attracting a growing flow of private investments for R&D due to a number of factors. The large pool of graduates and postgraduates in scientific fields, uh, wages that are still much lower of American and European wages, even for PhDs, low or non-existing limitations uh, in fields like stem cell research or genetically modified organisms, uh, generous tax incentives offered to multinational companies that create, uh, in those countries, greenfield research centers. Now, mind that these results are being obtained notwithstanding the fact that the overall education system is in bad shape and uh, under enormous strains, both in China and in India. Their, their uh, primary schools, their uh, even their high schools are not always that good. In fact, they're mostly underperforming, with exceptions, of course. The Shanghai high schools are very good ones, and they, they are on top of the OECD PISA international classification. But if you just go to a second tier uh, Chinese city, or even worse, in the countryside, their primary middle school, high school are very poor. So just imagine what uh, these countries would be able to do if they decide, once they decide, to overhaul their education systems and to invest even more resources into them. And let's not forget that both countries can use a shortcut because both India and China have recently proved successful in reversing their br brain drains. Luring back home many scientific and entrepreneur entrepreneurial talents uh, of their diaspora who had previously emigrated to the US or to Europe. I remember seeing the beginning of that process uh, while I was living in San Francisco, in, in the Silicon Valley, a few years ago already. You had. Chinese, uh, successful Chinese and Indians who uh, decided not to uh, live forever in the US. They were attracted to go back to their country. On the uh, January 11, 2007, the Popular Liberation Army of China, this is the name of the Chinese army, destroyed a Chinese meteorological satellite orbiting at a 800 kilometers altitude. Uh, this was a very bold experiment. Uh, the, the Pentagon in the US is worried that the Chinese are making significant progress uh, towards a Star Wars scenario. Uh, the Chinese armed forces are making headways in those uh, very technological sectors that where, where the US enjoyed uh, an unchallenged supremacy, like electronic espionage, the use of satellites for intelligence gathering and communication, uh, not to speak of cyber war. Uh, the People's uh, Republic defense budget have been growing steadily at double digit rates for years now. 
the People's Liberation Army is still the largest in the world in terms of numbers, sheer numbers, but it is becoming also leaner and more efficient. China has launched the construction of its uh, first blue water fleet in, in, a sen in centuries, in five centuries. A blue water fleet means a military fleet that would be able to navigate the whole world, to go to the Persian Gulf or even Latin America, not just to defend the coastal borders of China. This means that Beijing aims at being a global superpower for access to any energy-rich area in the world. Uh, the geopolitical reach of China is expanding in northeastern Asia, of course, where China has replaced the U.S. as the main economic partner for both Japan and South Korea, but also in Central Asia, in the Middle East, uh, in Africa, in Latin America. So because uh, Chinese trade, the Chinese investments and Chinese financial aid comes with no string attached, uh, unconditional, no interferences on human rights or democracy, the Chinese government is an excellent alternative for all the dictators or the anti-American leaders in the world, from Sudan to Venezuela, from Burma to Iran. China, together with Russia, together with Russia, represents both a strategic and intellectual challenge to our world. We are faced here with two authoritarian and illiberal models of capitalism, which have proved successful in governing the modernization of their countries. China has a much longer record than Russia, 30 years now, and therefore it is even more serious as a challenge. Moreover, the Chinese are selling a theory about the non-exportability of Western-style democracy. They theorize that liberal democracy and our concept of individualistic human rights is well tailored to our own cultural tradition, but it does not fit well into the mold of other societies with different sets of values like the Asian societies shaped by Confucian values, by the philosopher Confucius. On the other hand, there is India which is a very different story. Here is a country as large as China, both geographically and uh, demographically. It's even more diverse than China if you take into account its ethnicities, its different languages, and the number of religions that have followers there. India has at least uh, the some degree of social and economic inequalities, the same gaps between rich and poor, even more poverty and a higher illiteracy than China. And yet it has a vibrant democracy, uh, the largest democracy in the world, and a federalist state which accommodates uh, different identities into the flexible mode of a modern Indian nationalism. India will not be available for any kind of international alliance against the Chinese, and yet, uh, because it perceives itself as a great power and its uh, foreign policy will always have a very nationalistic colors and a distinct independent accent, the sheer success of the Indian experiment uh, with democracy is probably today the most effective antidote to the theory that only authoritarian regimes can foster strong growth uh, in large emerging countries. Thank you very much for your attention to my introductory speech. And uh, I will be glad now to uh, make your acquaintance and uh, through your, your questions, see, first of all, what uh, in your own business experience, what is the degree of exposure that you've had uh, to China, the impact of China in your own personal business life. So uh, my name is Joao Ferlan from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, actually in Brazil, I never had any experience, business experience uh, with the Chinese. Uh, instead of having a relationship with 
Chinese descendants, many that live in the country. But um, while I lived in the Philippines for two years, and that was something amazing for me when I realized that really the economic power of the country was in the hands of the Chinese families. As you said, it's like they really relate among themselves and really hold the, the economics of, of the, the country and, uh, and, and don't really uh, have relationship with the locals too. I remember friends that couldn't even, uh, uh, girls that couldn't even go out with Eastern or Western cultures besides the Chinese uh, boys. Then. <clears throat> and then on the business side, I worked for a, a high technology uh, co company. We were uh, developing some new technologies in the Philippines to export abroad. Uh, then we, we st when I started there, we had a partnership with a British company that provided us the technologies. And then when we started to develop the, the technologies, uh, we went to China, uh, specifically to Shenzhen, uh, to purchase light emitting diodes, was one of the technologies we were uh, doing some, some experiments there. And one very significant uh, experience for me was that Coming from an, another emerging economy, we are used to have the facilities of the big multinationals in the country. But there in the Philippines, I realized that it, we didn't need a facility in, in the home country, but we could do an OEM process and buy everything from the Chinese. They're very specialized on that. Professionals like architects of designing products. And this, this makes things very easy. But by that time, it was 2005, then people used to say that their products wouldn't be so high quality. And right now in Brazil, I see from clients of mine now there, that are closing the, the facilities that they have in Brazil to go to China as well, uh, that they, have, they can get very, very high quality products in Brazil. Anything you want, tailor-made, and a much better quality than in my country, my home. You mean country. in China? So in China. In China, yeah. mm -hmm. better quality than in Brazil, mm -hmm. lower price than mm -hmm. in Brazil. Last time I came to to Ems, I was in the plane at the plane, and I met uh, two people from a very big uh, clothes manufacturer in, in Brazil. Then I got to know that they don't manufacture in Brazil; <laughs> they manufacture in India and in China. And they were coming uh, from this trip around the, the, the facilities. And then the girl said, you know, in Sao Paulo state, where it's very traditional uh, cloth uh, making uh, region, cloth or uh, textile, uh -huh. textile material, which shut all the factories already. They said, we can get a, a shirt for 20 reais. 20 reais is something like $12. In China, you get for $1. That's why we produce it there. So uh, since I don't have uh, close relationships in my country, but this experience in, in the Philippines was uh, an open minder, which made me think on uh, what will happen next once they globalize themselves. I was especially concerned when you said they're building entrepreneur inside the country and exporting them. So Brazil, they don't have this. Uh, they didn't explore, they don't have this network as I saw in the Philippines. I know they have in Indonesia, because they have a revolution uh, some years ago, mm -hmm. like five, four years ago, against the Chinese, mm -hmm. and in Thailand and so on. So uh, I'm a bit afraid of that. Okay. Well, as a matter of fact, your, your experience uh, in the Philippines can be uh, uh, generalized because all of South, uh, yes, Southern East uh, Asia has very, very large uh, Chinese minorities uh, that, are, ha that have been there for centuries. They're much older than any Chinatown you can see in the United States or, or Europe. And they are usually the most advanced business communities. This is true for Fili the Philippines, Indonesia, but also Vietnam, um, Thailand. So the, the Chinese m minorities are really the business people there. They, they have enormous uh, power. And by the way, you, you, you said that you, you don't have an, a, a, 
an ex a direct experience of Chinese impact on in, in Brazil in your business, but but the Brazilian economy uh, is uh, very much uh, dependent on China as a market for its export growth. So that the Brazilian miracle you can't explain it without taking into account China as I don't, I was I was covering also the um, Obama's trip to Brazil this in March this year, and uh, I, I remember interviewing a number of. Uh, Brazilian uh, entrepreneurs and the, the chairman of Vale, for instance, told me, I wake up every morning and I pray God that China is well, because if China is well, we are, we are okay too. And, and we were also impressed because Obama decided to, have his, to make his first trip in a South American country in Brazil, because this is the superpower in South America now. But when we arrived, we learned that Dilma Rousseff would make her first official visit abroad in China, because China is now the first uh, economic partner to Brazil. Um, my father is doing business with China. He's an engineer, and they're working in a thermoelectric plant in Colombia. And it, for me, it's funny because um, my father um, when he started doing business with Chinese, it was his first approach to with working with Chinese. And after a while of seeing him working late, we started talking. He, since, since he's an engineer now with Michele, I understand him a little bit more. <laughs> but <laughs> um, he talks to he talked to me, and I didn't understand anything. So I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And now uh, when now when he talks to me about the Chinese, he's like he's really tired because uh, and he and I saw that he was reading the book, uh, The Art of War, and he was like they haven't really changed from this book to now because they what they do is tire the enemy, which was him in that case because they were negotiating, and they and he's like they are the, they are exhausting me because every time they negotiate something. Then they come back and they renegotiate and they renegotiate. And for example, this thermoelectric plant, they're doing it in a, in a, bio, a highly biodiversal zone in Colombia. And the Chinese wanted to bring 100 Chinese people to just clean the zone. And that is not the way because fortunately we have some like green uh, uh, regulation. So they have to take a psychologist to take the monkeys to somewhere else. But they really thought they could bring 100 Chinese people to Colombia and just clean the zone out. So they're um, very, like um, Claudio said, that they know they're a superpower. So they thought they could come to Colombia and do whatever they wanted and just tire the enemy. So that's what I know about them and that they have American names. So they are like Kim, Kelly. La, uh, it's Lakers, yeah. and it was really funny. So, uh, by the way, if any, if anybody doesn't know who is uh, what is the art of war, this is the most famous uh, treaty on military art by Sun Tzu, uh, and it's uh, for the Chinese. It's one of their <laughs> classical books uh, uh, that they study. They have they have been studying for more than a thousand years now. Like for us, von Clausewitz in Europe. I'm not engaged in relation, business relationship with China or India, but we had a candidate uh, of EMS coming from China two years ago. He was a she. That's rather strange. So she, she was a? She. She. She was. She. she. Uh, okay, okay. Coming Why from strange? China, it's not that strange. Uh, we were uh, we we expected a man. Uh -huh. uh, instead, uh, she came. But what is what was surprising? I don't know how much this can be. How much if this is a case, just a case, a single case, or is uh, a ritual? But instead of uh, sending the application by internet as usual, as all people do, we received a huge box, a huge box. Uh, with uh, a present for everyone. So in the box there was a letter, the application, a letter uh, written by hands that mm, she was describing everything. And then there was uh, an agenda, two pens, <laughs> uh, all the things. So and, and she said, uh, thank you for processing my application. So she was astonished at what we found in the box. <laughs> that came. So this is a case that That's uh, funny. Yeah. Has, has remained here. That's funny. I uh, wouldn't be surprised that uh, a young lady would qualify because uh, my experience of the 
the relationship between the two, the two genders in, in China is that whereas in, in the countryside uh, women are still in, in, a, in a very uh, inferior position, social position, uh, and sometimes this can be brutal. Um, in uh, modern China, I mean in the big cities uh, where there has been uh, more economic development, they are, there's substantial parity, in, 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 especially in the business world, not in politics. In the Communist Party, you look at the Politburo, where are the, 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 big, the big bosses of the Communist Party, it's nine out of ten are men. But in the business world, there are many, many uh, very successful Chinese women. Now one question, what's going to happen in Chinese politics? Because I was reading some articles that the actual president who should be re-elected for the last time right now is like not as strong as his, like the ones before. And, I, I will, and, and in the, the in, old one in, from, yeah, the, sorry. from the Shanghai group, they're like coming back and actually it's like the old one is representing himself in some kind of way. In, uh, in, one of my, uh, in one of these uh, courses, I will uh, deal more directly with the politics of the Communist Party. But uh, first of all, the president of China is not elected. He is chosen by his peers. It's, of course, uh, typical of a Communist Party. Uh, there has been already the succession to Hu Jintao. Hu Jintao is now the president. Uh, the succession will start in 2012 gradually and it's a very now it's a very organized uh, uh, the procedure is now very well in place it's not like when Mao died uh, there were infighting even violent uh, purges uh, the losers would risk their life uh, or, or, or or at least they would go to jail uh, they would fall into disgrace now it's something much smoother so we already know who is it's Mr. Xi uh, Xi Jinping will be the next uh, president of China. He will start inheriting the, uh, the president of the republic. Then he will become also chairman of the Communist Party and then chairman of the armed forces. These are, are the, tr the three powers that will be concentrated. But it's a very collegial, it's a collective kind of power. So these figures are not as powerful as Mao was or even as Deng Xiaoping was, the successor to Mao. Um, it's true that, that now the Shanghai, what, what you refer to the Shanghai clan, that was Jiang Zemin, the, before, the predecessor of Hu Jintao. He came from Shanghai. Xi Jinping comes from uh, 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 a region, that, the Fujian region, which is a very wealthy area. So it's true that the, he is more the expression of the capitalist China. Uh, not of the poorer regions. But I don't think we will see a lot of differences between Hu Jintao and Xi Jinping. It will happen in between 2012 and 2013. It will be a smooth process, and I don't think we should expect uh, major changes in their strategy. We may have... Uh, oh, by the way, you, you, you were speaking about Colombia. Uh, yeah, you were speaking about There's a, that, that very interesting infrastructure project financed mostly by the Chinese, which is uh, defined or dubbed as the second uh, Panama Canal, which is a land. In fact, it's a land crossing of uh, South America, and it, it will cross Colombia. It, it, it will be a major link between the Pacific coast and the Atlantic coast, and it will shorten uh, impressively uh, the, the time to transport goods uh, from Brazil to China. So you will have two options, the Panama Canal and uh, the land canal uh, crossing Colombia. And that's a huge investment. It's mostly with Chinese money. So let's have a break.